Well, good morning, church. It's so good to be with you here this morning. So cool to see families uh, just committing, uh, dedicating the, the lives of their kids uh, to the Lord. You know, um, my wife and I have a, have a newborn, and uh, so we'll be doing the commitment in the spring, which is a reminder for anyone who's like, I didn't know this was happening. Well, you can do it when it comes around again. Uh, the important thing is just to do it, but but to, we want to be a church that makes disciples, and that starts in our, in our homes. And so we're just so thankful, grateful for what God's doing. And, uh, you know, I'm excited to partner with, with all these wonderful uh, families in that. You can go and open your Bibles uh, to 1 Corinthians 11 this morning. We're going to jump right in. Um, got a lot to cover. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're new here, uh, I want to say welcome. Uh, I want to just invite you into a, what's a, really a family conversation um, if you haven't already guessed this morning, we're going to be talking about the Lord's table, about communion. I'll use those terms interchangeably over the course of, of this morning. And, and, um, and the reality is communion is for those who have committed their lives for Christ uh, as apprentices, as disciples, uh, to follow him as Lord, Savior, Rabbi, and King. And so um, you just get to tune in uh, if, you're, if you're here for the first time and you don't know Jesus yet, uh, you're more than welcome. We'd love to ha- have you eventually join us at the table. Um, but for the rest of us, um, you know... It, Preparing for this message has been honestly really um, challenging in, in a way that it's not normally. Uh, just coming into it pretty heavy hearted. And um, it's a hard text. There's some hard things to say. And we all need to hear them. And so I just want to encourage you to lean in this morning uh, with me uh, to the text. And, and just, I'm just asking, I've been praying that the Spirit would move and prompt our hearts, uh, you know, not just to hear these words, but to put them in the practice. Um, and uh, kind of we talked about last week, Eric talked about like the essentials of the faith and preferences versus essentials. And, and communion is, a, is an essential uh, for us. We do it every week. Um, but we want to kind of revision it, look at is there anything we've missed, uh, learn from Paul uh, what he has to share with the Corinthians. And, and, um, and this matters. This really matters because uh, for the first 500 years of church history, the church almost solely gathered around tables like this. And for the first 1,500 years of church history, uh, even in large gatherings, the table was still the center. And it wasn't until a guy named Ulrich Zwingli in the Reformation, and there were some not so bad reasons for this, but he decided to to bring the pulpit and put the pulpit in the center and move the table aside. And so there's a lot of things that I think we need to relearn and and repent of when it comes to the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table, uh, communion. And so I want us to rediscover what Jesus' intention for this table is this morning. And why does it matter so much? I wanted to just kind of up front just lay out some of, of, of Paul's critiques, some, his warnings, to make sure we know how serious this is. And this is what he says in a couple of different verses, 20, 27, and 29. He's critiquing the Corinthians. So then, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. So then whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. Coming to this table is foundational, it's essential, and we need to get it right. And so I just want to invite you on a journey of, of, of going deeper. And there's going to be a kind of a common thread. I want to throw it out there for you just up front. Um, everything that I have to say can be tied back in some way to this. The communion isn't just about you and God. Communion isn't just about you and God. It's just not. And that's something that then some of our upbringing, you know, in, in my church is that, that that is what it ends up being. It's just about, about me and God. But we're going we're gonna to hopefully um, bust some preconceptions about communion. We're going to talk about what, what's going on in Corinth, what Paul was critiquing and the craziness there. We're going to talk about uh, what the Lord's Supper really is and, and, and what Jesus intended for it. And then we're going to be challenged about how we can, we can uh, maybe move forward more faithfully in coming to this table every week and, and even outside the walls of this, uh, this church building. So let's go ahead and jump in together. Uh, verse 17, I'm going to read uh, from verse 17. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there has been uh, differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. 
So when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat or drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. Jumping down to verse 33. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Anyone who is hungry should eat something at home so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. And when I come, I will give further directions. So Paul, as he unfortunately often is, he's not very happy with the Corinthians. He's, he's here to correct yet again one more thing that they're doing wrong. For all their passion and hunger for Jesus, they get it wrong a lot. And we're thankful for that because we can learn from it. He says it is not the Lord's Supper that they are doing, even though they think it is. Their gatherings are marked by divisions and injustice. Some are eating before they even get here. Keep in mind, Paul has just got done answering some questions that seems like he'd been written to about who to eat with and what to eat when it comes to food sacrifice to idols and whatnot. We talked about that a little bit last week. And and, uh, here's some things he said about that. So whenever you eat or drink and whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble. And then early on, no one should seek their own good but the good of God. Of others, And so he jumps straight from answering those questions, and he's like, oh, by the way, while we're speaking, speaking of food, I want to talk to you about how you're abusing the Lord's Supper. It should also be assumed here, the text assumes, that the Lord's Supper is an actual meal around an actual table, and it's meant to be done in community, and, and no one is supposed to be left out. The Lord's Supper is the language in this passage, but in other places, breaking of bread. Koinonia is another Greek word that is oftentimes used for the Lord's Supper. And it literally means fellowship with one another and with God. This is important. It's about community. You see, in our society and the things that we're so self-focused, we need to move. The table invites us from a self-focused Uh, self-centered focus into radical community. Biblical communion is with both God and others. So what exactly was going on in Corinth? What were these crazy things happening? Let's go a little bit deeper, help understand the context, what was going on. Uh, So so the Corinthian uh, people, they were having these dinner parties. Uh, And this was a pretty common practice in the Greco-Roman world. It was called the symposium. The wealthy ate in one room while the slaves were in the other. And they they, they waited until they were needed. They came in and served the the wealthy. After the meal was over, it moved into phase two, which was called the the convivia, which is where we get the word convivial. And so it's this raucous, uh, I won't use the word joy, this crazy party. And the women and the children would leave. The men would get drunk. They'd bring the slaves in and have their way with them. And this was a common practice throughout the, the Greco-Roman uh, world. It was, it was normal. And so some of these things, not necessarily the sexual things, although honestly we already learned the Corinthians were messed up in that way too, but, but some of these things were seeping into the way they were practicing the Lord's Supper together. And Paul has some things to say about it. He says this is not the Lord's Supper. The, the, you see, the, the rich would, 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 would get there early and they'd bring their lavish feasts and they'd, they'd be waited on. And then like the, the, the more poor among them would show up and, and only the scraps were left and they'd have to wait on the outside of the rooms. This is not the Lord's Supper. And we think contrasting Jesus, the, the night he initiated the Lord's Supper, he, he ate with his disciples and after the meal, what did he do? He didn't throw some crazy party leaving them out. He, he washed their feet. And so the Lord's Supper needs to be grounded in sacrificial service to one another. And this is the complete opposite of what we see happening here in, in, in Corinth. And so the early church, it, the Lord's Supper was a, we, an act of social justice. It was, it was the way that the poor would be fed in the community. We don't talk about that very much. But, but throughout the early centuries, that was one of the ways that so many people came to know Jesus is that these Christians would actually feed the poor and care for the poor and the outcasts of society. And that was what the Lord's Supper was. And the Corinthians were refusing to do this in their selfishness. 
You know, I, I love food. I love eating out. One of my favorite places in town is Golden Harbor. It's Chinese food. I, I, it's just, I think it's the best Chinese in town. Granted, I have not eaten all the places, but so far it's the best I've found. And I love it especially because it's kind of like that family style. And so you take home like two or three extra meals worth at, at, the, end of, at the end of the meal. I just, you know, it's, it's so good. It's like I just can't wait till lunch the next day or dinner the next day. It's, you know, coming, coming home, is like, man, I'm just excited to eat these leftovers. And, and you may know where this is, is going, but, you know, inevitably there's, there's occasionally, you know, I come home and, and my beautiful, loving wife has indulged in the leftovers that I was looking forward to and they are no longer left and it is a tragedy. And uh, uh, I vaguely re- recall that Eric had a similar run-in with Diana, but that's, uh, maybe it's just a marriage thing. Uh, but you know, you know when you're looking forward to something, looking forward to a meal and you miss out of, of some kind, it's, it's one of the worst feelings out there. And this is what's happening in Corinth, but to the nth degree, because this is the Lord's Supper. This is, this is the, the reconciliation, restoration, and redemption. We're celebrating what God has done in our community. And, 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 I get, and then they show up and there's just scraps. And I'm not even let in the, into the room. And it's a tragedy and it's an injustice. The issue here in Corinth is is not first and foremost their relationship with God, but about their relationship to one another, which is crippling their relationship with God. And uh, many people, rich people in the ancient world, would pride themselves on giving away the scraps. Like, at least we're giving away the scraps. Look how amazing I am and how much food I have. I have scraps left over. But that's not the way the disciples of Jesus are called. That everyone is welcome to the table to to indulge in the feast of the kingdom. That was how it was supposed to be. But the Corinthian church giving into elitism, failing to love the least of these among them. So communion, again, it's not just about God and us. It's about us and our relationship to others. And it ultimately invites us from cultural norms to sacrificial hospitality that all are welcome at the table and that we think of the least of these in our community, in these walls and outside. We want to be a welcoming space. You know, where was Jesus throughout all of his ministry? He was at a table with sinners and tax collectors and prostitutes. And there are traditions out there who, who believe that every time people gather, Christians gather around a table, it is the Lord's Supper, no matter who's there. And I don't think that's... In, entirely terrible theology, that we are inviting others into, missionally into our spaces to show them the love of Jesus. And the Corinthians were refusing to do this. And so I'm going to have three questions throughout this. The first question for you to reflect on, to chew on, you'll have some time later to think about it some more, but, but who are you not sharing a table with? Who are you not sharing a table with? Who's left out? Who have you not thought about? Who have you not thought about inviting here, but also in your groups, your Bible studies, your communities at home? Who are you you not sharing a table with? Think about that. The table is for anyone who wants to follow Jesus. And we're reminded that Jesus called the disciples before they fully believed in him. I don't know if you realize that. They They were excited and they're like, maybe this is the Messiah, but who knows? And they're just like, let's just go. So the invitation is to invite others, even when we don't think they're ready. Come, come meet this Jesus guy. Come to the table. Mother Teresa once said, loneliness is the feeling of being unwanted in the most terrible form of poverty. The greatest disease in the West today is not uh, TV, digital media, or, or leprosy. It's being unwanted, unloved, and uncared for. And we, as the body of Christ, are called to invite others who are unwanted, unloved, and uncared for to our gatherings. To be thinking of them. First, but Paul's just getting started. He critiques them for some things that are, that are going on, and he continues by reminding them of the way that Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. So we, 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 we carry on in verses 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Paul is reminding them of the way Jesus did things. How he started it all. 
And there's a couple of things that are significant. The first thing is the word remembrance. And, and I want us to reframe this, this word. It's oftentimes one-dimensional. It's like I'm just going to think about something in the past. And that is not what Paul and Jesus are inviting us into. Let me give you an example. I, I enjoy, uh, uh, it's football season, so uh, there was a basketball football game, I think, going on right now, you know, over in London, so super exciting. You know, but just think of like a football game, maybe like a, a, a peewee football game, and there's, a, there's a, a coach, and you're coaching a kid, and you just, and, and, and they get like, I don't know if they throw flags, with, I, you know, I don't have, a, my kid's not old enough to play, maybe they throw flags when they're early, maybe not, but uh, they're not lining up well, and so the coach is like, hey, hey buddy, remember, remember you need to line up in this position. And then he's like, okay, and, then the, and the kid just, you know, sits down on the field and closes their eyes and just somberly reflects, I'm remembering the words of my coach to stand in the right position on the field. Is that remembrance? No. No, that's, not, that's ridiculous. No, remembrance is grounded in reality. Remembrance is grounded in, in, in remembering of, of, of bringing the past into the present. And at the communion table, it's also bringing the future into the present, that the kingdom has come. It's now and not yet, but we are, it's, it's, this is, it is broken in at this table, around these tables in our communities. This is the kingdom of God here and now. We remember what Jesus has done and what he's going to do and what he's doing in our midst. That is remembrance. You see, the, the, the this and do this in remembrance of me refers not just to the bread and the juice and a moment of reflection, but to the entire meal. It's a, it's, a, it's a family of apprentices to the kingdom of God, to Jesus Christ himself, gathering around a table and remembering, reenacting past, present, and future. And it invites us from passive reflection into embodied remembrance. That's what the table does. John Mark Hicks, he says this about the Lord's Supper. The church eats a post-resurrection meal with Jesus through the breaking of the bread, eating the presence of the living Christ. is not a funeral act or a sad memorial of his death, but a vibrant declaration of the gospel, of the good news that Christ died and rose again for the sake of the world. But more than a declaration, it is indeed an experience of the living Christ himself. Thus joy and celebration encircles the table rather than mourning and sadness. Why would anyone eat a post-resurrection meal with Jesus in sadness? Past, present, future in one moment of celebration around the table. Let's dive deeper into that by talking about covenants, by talking about covenants. So uh, Paul reminds us, uh, the, reminds the Corinthians and us, that at the, at, at the night he was betrayed, Jesus said these words, that this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. What does, he, what does he mean by that? What, is, what, what do covenants have to do with, with communion? A little history, you know, throughout the Bible there's various kinds of covenants, but one of the more common ones is, is one that usually involves some kind of sacrifice, a commitment, and some kind of celebration, oftentimes involving what was sacrificed. Does that sound familiar? So Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he broke bread and he said, this is my, my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And on that night, the disciples were like, what is going on? This is like, is he leaving us? Is, you know, it's, it's distressing. But hindsight's twenty twenty, And after the resurrection, they're like, now we get it. The Lord's Supper is a party celebrating what Jesus has done and looking forward to what he's going to do and, and living it up in the present. Worshiping together as a family around this table. And, you know, we, we don't really have uh, any covenants left standing except for maybe marriage, although it's really more contractual today anyway, in our society. And what do you do after a marriage? You throw a party. You go to a reception. You dance you know, the night away. And, you know, um, I, I'll just, you know, preface this by saying, you know, Kinsey and I, my wife and I, we're, we're, we're not really like lit people. We're pretty laid back, pretty chill. You know, we don't, you know. But to this day, and I know I'm slightly biased, but I'm also fairly objective. I don't know. I at least pretend I am. Our wedding reception was lit. Like I danced and everyone danced and it wasn't even dark and there wasn't even lights. Like everyone was just getting in on the dance floor and it was just crazy. And we were celebrating and, and you know, like I just haven't been to a wedding like that since. And um, it's probably good because it was my wedding. But, you know, it, 
it's one of those things. We celebrate these things. This, and and the, 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 the table is meant to have that same kind of feeling. We are celebrating the resurrection. We are celebrating the new family, the, the wedding supper of the lamb that we are invited to. That is what Jesus invites us to at the table. And so it invites us from solemn contemplation to exuberant thanksgiving. From solemn contemplation to exuberant thanksgiving. This is why after Jesus took the bread, er, uh, he took the bread and after he had given thanks, he broke it. The communion table should be a time of gratitude, celebration. It invites us into community, the joy of community together and the community of the Holy Spirit. And in fact, globally and historically, the most common name for communion is actually the Eucharist. A lot of the higher churches use it, but globally and historically, that's, that's the most common name, the Eucharist. And that's significant because the Greek word, uh, Eucharisto, means to give thanks, which is also used for the Lord's Supper and other places in Scripture. So we give thanks, we celebrate, we throw a party. Philip Yancey says this, this table is different. It isn't where sinners find Christ, but where sons and daughters celebrate being found. Maybe someday instead of solemnly making our way to the tables, we should dance for joy. Maybe we should sing every born again song that we know. Maybe we should tell our homecoming stories and laugh like people who no longer fear death. Maybe we should ask if anyone wants seconds and hold our little cups high to toast lost sinners found and dead brothers and sisters alive. That's right. Amen. This is, this is good news. This is communion. This is the invitation to the Lord's table. And so my second question for you to reflect on this morning is what is your posture when you come to communion? What is your posture when you come to the Lord's table? And is there any adjustments that might be needed? Picking up in verse 27. This is the hardest part. This is the hardest passage uh, of this passage. I, I, uh, I've been praying over you guys and myself that we would live this out. And, um, and so it's hard. Let's lean in. Verse 27. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread And drink the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, we were uh, we are judged in this way by the Lord. We are being disciplined by Him, so that we will not be finally condemned with. The world. These are where Paul's most dire warnings come to us that we need to take seriously and we need to reflect how is this present in our community. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. There are few more serious passages in all of scripture than that sentence right there. He goes on to say to give a practical, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And if they don't do that without discerning the body of Christ, they drink judgment upon themselves. He is calling out the Corinthians' behavior, not necessarily towards God, but towards one another. And it is affecting the entire community. If this is the Lord's table, you should be doing it differently. You should be doing it like Jesus, sacrificial service. They are misremembering what Jesus' death accomplished, and they're failing to embody the present and future hope in the future kingdom by dismembering, literally, the body of Christ, the members of the body of Christ. And because of their neglect of the poor, some are getting sick and dying. I don't know what could be much worse than that. 
He alludes to this kind of idea in a different situation back in chapter 8, verse 12. He says, when you sin against them, the body of Christ, in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. When we sin against one another, we are sinning against Christ himself. And here's the deal. Communion is not the time for you to get right with God. The Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table is not the time for you to get right with God. The reality is, you are, if you are in Christ, you are a new creation, and you are already right with God. The Lord's Table is a a place where you are invited to embody and live out that right relationship with God through relationship with others. By showing forgiveness and love that you have received from Christ. And, uh, you know, Paul actually... If you read carefully, he implores them, he says, examine themselves before they come to the table. On your own time, before you come to to this house and you have a meal and you, you celebrate the Lord's Supper, you are to be examining yourselves. Is there any wrong way that I am living in? Search me and know me, O Lord, as the psalmist writes. Lead me in the way everlasting. Reveal in me any broken way. And it is before we come to the table that this happens. And a lot of us, myself included, are often too lazy to make space for that. We'll wait till the three minutes are on the screen. Uh, I'm not saying that's, that's a good time. I'd rather you become aware than not at all. But let's take this seriously and let's come to our gatherings, having thought through not from a place of God doesn't want us. No, he does want us. He wants all of us. He wants the community together reconciled at the table. We need to examine ourselves and lead into repentance before we come to this table. See, the table invites us from unexamined participation which we're all guilty of at different times, into vulnerable confession. And James remind us uh, that confession is, is not just only, in fact, it's primarily, probably, with others. We confess our sins to one another so that we might be healed. That we come to others and we say, I have wronged you, I have done this, I have failed. It is in community that we are healed. God has already forgiven us on the cross. That forgiveness is embodied in our confession, courageous, vulnerable confession in community around before the table, actually. Paul's judgment is unmistakably clear. The Corinthians have brought suffering on their community by their divisiveness, by the way they are living. And we we need to be careful that we are not the same. You know, it's, it's one of the most uncomfortable things when we come to a table and we're sitting with someone who we have something against or if they have something against us. You know, family gatherings where the last conversation you had was a fight and you just have to be there because it's holidays. The reality is we avoid tables with the people that we're at odds with, with our enemies. But the Lord's table is meant to be different. It's the last thing that we need to be invited into. Confession isn't enough. To practice the Lord's table, to practice communion in a, in a worthy manner. It invites us from abstract forgiveness into relational reconciliation. from abstract forgiveness to relational reconciliation. The final verses, verse 33 and 34. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Anyone who's hungry should eat something at home so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. And when I come, I will give further directions. We are called back to this table together as a reconciled community.
Here's the deal. It's really easy to come into a room and sit in these chairs when someone on the other side of the room you have something against. You'll just sit on the other side of the room. You'll just avoid it. You'll bury it. It is not easy to sit at the table with them. But that is what Jesus invites us to. We have been forgiven and reconciled to God and shame on us if we withhold that from others. You see, those of you who are OCD have noticed that there's this chair over here. It's just sitting here. And the invitation for each and every one of us, maybe we are this chair, but maybe there's someone else that we need to take and we need to invite back to the table of King Jesus in forgiveness and reconciliation and embodying the way of Jesus in what he has done for us. You see, it's, it's, really e- like, it's really easy for us to separate from other people. And here's the hard truth. Because we do not love them deeply enough. My heart is broken because we have 10 million denominations who love their beliefs more than, than one another. The disunity of our churches and our movements is because we would rather have right doctrine than right relationship. And I'm not saying that doctrine and beliefs don't matter. But I am saying that relational reconciliation is the goal with God and with others at this table. And so I... I, uh, I want to invite you to to reflect. This this third question is, is there a sister or a brother in this room? Or frankly, we we, we too often will say, oh, my church is First Christian Church. Well, guess what? God does not make those kind of distinctions. The church is global and it is local. And so maybe there's someone, I don't know, a couple states over you have something against. Maybe there's someone else in town you have a broken relationship with and Christ is inviting you to reconcile so you can come to this table and celebrate his goodness are there any brothers or sisters who you have something against or they have something against you and and God just asks us to to invite to extend a hand to do our best and he'll take the rest so I know there are situations that seem irreconcilable and and we just need to be faithful and prayerful and intentional to be invitational to do our part, to come to this table. You know, uh, in Matthew 5, Jesus says this, that if you are offering your gift at the altar and they remember your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. The crazy thing about this is that he is talking about the altar in Jerusalem, probably, and he is preaching in Galilee. And it is a long way days, sometimes weeks to get to Jerusalem. And he is saying, if you are ready, you're going up to Jerusalem to celebrate and you're bringing something to the altar and you get all the way there and you're like, my brother has something against me. You're going to go all the way back to Galilee and reconcile before you come back to the altar. That is how important it is that we embody this, not from a legalistic kind of perspective. Hope you hear my heart in this. This is the best way to live. When we live broken in relationships, we suffer the consequences. This is what was happening in Corinth. Be reconciled to God and be reconciled to one another. And so as we wind down this morning, is there anyone who has something against you or you have something against them who's a brother and sister in Christ? And in a minute, we're going we're gonna to partake of communion together, all together. And so the, the timer is going to go on the screen uh, in just a second. And you're going to have three minutes to reflect on the three questions that I've laid out over the course of this morning. One, who is not at your table? And therefore, who do you need to invite? Two, what is the posture that you come to this table at weekly? What might need to shift? And three, is there anything you have against someone that you need to, you need to go out and make a call right now? Or you need to abstain from communion this week because you need to go have a conversation and make it right. Because Jesus has more for you and for us. 
And if only we would come to this table reconciled and unified, the world would see us so much differently. Those are the three questions. Spend three minutes reflecting on them, examining yourselves, and we're going to come back and we're going to take both of the elements together as one family.